Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Happening Multicultural Festival. Thank you so much for tuning in. Of course, if you're tuned in right now, show your love in the comments and let, let us hear your voice. For those who are new, my name is Veronica Gomez, and I'll be the moderator for today's panel. I am so excited to say that we're officially in Happening Multicultural Festival, and we're having events and panels every single day leading up to the end of this month. So that is so, so exciting. Of course, for anybody that is new here, Happening Multicultural Festival is the first and only Toronto festival made by community artists giving center stage to the talents and skills of immigrant, newcomer, and refugee artists. This year, we are focusing on the theme of public art and collective voice. That is so, so exciting, and I'm so honored to be here tonight. For, for today's panel, we'll be diving into the theme of collective healing through the arts. Many of us has, have realized how important it is to find ways of supporting our mental health during these difficult times. And many of us have actually found new or different ways to cope with this. Today, we will be exploring how art can be a fundamental tool as we acknowledge the power of art as a type of healing therapy. We will also further explore the individual practices in the arts, as well as the ways in which these practices can contribute to our collective well-being. A reminder that this event is live streamed through our Facebook page and recorded for YouTube later on. Please feel free to let, let us know any comments, any questions you have throughout the panel. And of course, we'll get to the questions at the end of this session. Thank you so much. And before we continue, I also wish to express and acknowledge the land we are situated upon. We recognize that we live and work on indigenous traditional territories. I also wish to acknowledge that I'm currently located on the traditional indigenous territory of the Hirawenda, the Haudenosaunee, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credits. I also wish to acknowledge Mother Earth for the resources we are using to transmit this beautiful session tonight. And I also wish to acknowledge all the First Nation, Métis, and Inuit people who have been living on this land since time in memorial. So today we have such a beautiful session, as I already mentioned. We're joined with three amazing, amazing panelists, each bringing to the space incredible knowledge and insights from different perspectives. So without further ado, no more rambling from me, I introduce our amazing panelists, Hanan Hazim, Tanzina Amin, and Victoria Mata into the space. Hanan is a multidisciplinary artist, creative writer, community arts educator, and creative writing instructor located in Toronto. Tanzina Amin is a visual artist, art teacher, energy healer, and wellness mentor with a background in architecture. And Victoria Mata is a Venezuelan Canadian settler in Toronto polylingual choreographer, dance artist, and activist with a background in expressive arts therapy. Thank you so much, ladies, for joining me tonight. And of course, I'll give you the space to fully introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about your practice. If you don't mind, maybe we can start with Tanzina. Oh, thank you, Veronica. Thank you for having me here today. I'm honored to be part of this panel along with Hanan and Victoria. Um, so to introduce myself, I'm a Bangladeshi Canadian artist, as well as a curator, teacher, energy healer, and wellness mentor. I go by the pronouns she, her. I'm also a proud mom of two young men and a stepmom of three young men, so five. <laughs> uh, my education and career background is in architecture and then I moved on to global sourcing and quality assurance when I moved to Canada. So I know it kind of sounds all over the place so I'll just back up a bit to share my story. So I started painting 37 years ago then took a very long break from art when I started university and uh, then came back to art in 2009. So my art journey started as a teenager back in Bangladesh and uh, my parents enrolled me in an art school where I took um, professional oil painting lessons for two years. And 
the mindset where I grew up was uh, that art is not a profession. It's more of a hobby. No matter how good you are at it, no matter how passionate you are, it's like, yeah, you can do art on the side, but when you're pursuing your career, you're going for a profession, a doctor, engineer, lawyer. So I studied to become an architect and uh, eventually got busy with education and career and life and didn't paint for over two decades. So one of the reasons that I stopped painting was because I met someone who told me that art was a complete waste of time and I believed him. So I just stopped. Fast forward 23 years, I was going through a stage of depression due to major family struggles. I was at a point where I couldn't see any light at the end of the tunnel. And I eventually started seeing a therapist who suggested that I try to find a creative outlet. And uh, when I told her that I actually did pain many, many years ago, um, she immediately suggested that, oh, just go back to your passion and start painting again. So um, I remember doubting myself whether I could really do that. Like it's been so long, did I even remember how to draw or how to paint? So I eventually went out and bought the art supplies, which in itself was very exciting, going out to buy brushes and paint and canvas. And uh, when I sat down to paint, it was like I had never stopped. It's like I was in this zone and anyone that's an artist, whether visual or non-visual, you'll know exactly what that means. It's that meditative state, that zone that you're in when you're doing art. So at that time, I promised myself, never again am I giving up my passion just because someone else said so. So, and I also learned that you start to heal once you feel that you can express yourself. And for me, art was a way for me to express myself. And I, mean, I immediately saw changes in my own mood. I, I started healing. People around me noticed it. And I started to see the light at the end of the tunnel again. So around that time, I also started teaching art lessons. Um, I had taught in the past as well at university. And uh, then I, at that all, all along, I was still working full time, long hours, very fast paced uh, environment, but I kept on doing art whenever I could on the side. It took me about another six years to gather enough confidence to start showing my art in public. And then eventually I started curating exhibitions and opened an art gallery, Artusiasm, with my husband, who is also my biggest supporter of my passion. So unfortunately, we had to close the gallery in 2019. Um, so, in the recent years, uh, I went through a series of losses in my immediate family, which were all kind of sudden and unexpected deaths. And I was again in a very dark place. And uh, long story short, I was sent to a hospice for post-traumatic grief therapy. And what I didn't expect was that there was this holistic approach to the therapy like not only weekly counseling uh, for many, many months, but also weekly one-on-one -on -one art therapy for close to a year and uh, monthly group art therapy and meditation, massage, acupuncture, because there was also a lot of physical pain associated with the grief and uh, Reiki and like, I could see all this change. And again, my 
family could also see the change in me, which was just amazing. Like I never thought that this whole holistic approach would re was really necessary. So I didn't even know I needed grief therapy. But so at that time, 2019, my priorities changed. I left my corporate career after over 25 years and uh, started volunteering for the first time in my life. Started volunteering with an arts organization and also uh, volunteering at the hospice where uh, I received therapy. And I started spending a lot more time with art. And uh, I began to find ways to educate myself further in uh, holistic healing. So now I'm a certified Reiki practitioner and I facilitate meditations and other wellness and art activities at the hospice. I'm currently pursuing my Reiki master certification. I'm trained in uh, grief, empathy, healing, mindfulness, and creative expressions. I am a certified healing with the arts coach, as well as a certified palliative volunteer. And uh, now I help others heal using my knowledge, training, and uh, personal experience and creative and holistic approaches. Amazing, Tanzina. Thank you so, so much for being so open and just filled with genuinity in everything you say. It's an honor to have you here today. And of course, I've worked with you before, so I'm not being biased when I say she is amazing and so many, so, so much knowledge and wisdom comes from you. So thank you so much. Um, I think we can continue with Hanan. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your practice. Hi everyone, uh, thank you Veronica and Muse Arts for having me here. It's uh, wonderful to be on this amazing panel with uh, Victoria and Tenzina. Um, so I'm Hanan, uh, I'm a multidisciplinary artist. Um, so I dabble in different art forms, um, including creative writing, visual arts, performance arts. Um, I often joke that I kind of do all art forms except for, for music. I, I don't really know how to play any instruments, but um, recently I've been trying to learn how to play the drums. It hasn't been going <laughs> super well. Um, but yeah, I'm, I, I just love exploring all kinds of art forms. Um, I'm also uh, community arts educator, um, as well as like a writing instructor. Um, so I have a formal education in creative writing. I have a master's of arts degree uh, in English literature and creative writing, as well as my, my bachelor's degree was uh, a split between English creative writing and uh, biological sciences. So it's an, it was an arts and science degree. And I, uh, it was like a choice be between uh, going into uh, sciences, going into med school, becoming a doctor. I, I had all the grades for it. It's what my family wanted me to do, but I just loved the arts more like I love the sciences but I just love the arts a lot more so I decided to get my master's in creative writing um and then that was my sole focus and I'd always been doing visual arts but I hadn't really done much visual arts throughout university uh the last time I had done visual arts was in high school uh, so I was really really focused on my creative writing for a really long time uh, and then when I graduated from grad school and I moved to Toronto and I took a visual arts workshop and then that started me back on, on doing visual arts. So I'm not formally trained in visual arts or performance arts, uh, but I am formally trained in, in creative writing. So there, um, it was just, I sort of just fell into <laughs> the, the visual arts and I, found myself teaching art classes, writing classes, and it's uh, it's been really, really fun. Um, there's a lot of different kinds of classes that I teach. I wouldn't say any of them. I wouldn't classify them as art therapy. Uh, not all of them are, the intention behind them isn't 
even therapy or, or healing. It's just to have fun with the art or to teach people a certain technique, uh, um, especially with, with the writing. So for instance, right now I'm teaching a class called uh, Reclaiming Our Mother Tongues, and I think I've taught it with Mies Arts as well, but uh, this time I'm doing a 10 week version of, of that same course. And so we're uh, having a group of BIPOC folks and we are all writing using our mother tongues. And so it, the intention behind that class, it wasn't to, to heal, but because the act of reclaiming your mother tongue or decolonizing your, your language or reclaiming your ancestry, it, it is a healing act for a lot of people because there's a lot of trauma that they've experienced. And so taking back that power has been very healing. So I, would, I wouldn't ever classify myself as an art therapist or um, that my goal for art is, is healing. I think it just happens naturally because art is therapeutic, um, even if your intention isn't for it to be therapy. That's just my take on it. And I think uh, people might sometimes confuse what I do as art therapy because I do um, teach at CAMH uh, through the Art Cart program, which is ran by Workman Arts, which is a um, uh, mental health and arts organization for artists with lived experience. So I think sometimes people you know, we'll see that and we'll think, oh, you're doing art therapy, but I, I'm not uh, a clinician. I am not, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not a therapist. I'm an artist. So the art is always first for me and the healing comes through the art because when you're creating art, I feel like you're engaging um, your, your heart, your soul, your mind. Uh, you could even be engaging your body as well. And so it is very holistic. Um, and I, I really, so, so that's on one hand, like when I'm, when I'm teaching art and then creating art for myself, um, there have been instances where I've kind of channeled my trauma and my pain through my art. Um, and just recently I've had this realization that I was, I was doing that for myself. And then I did start to share some of that work with the outside world, but then I felt like maybe I was falling into into trauma clowning where it was always expected of me to be uh, channeling my trauma into my art. And that, I realized, you know, that's not healthy either because that, in a way, that could also make me sick if I didn't want to do that. So I thought, you know, I need a balance. So I've, I've been trying to also channel joy through the art, that it doesn't always have to be a way to um, express your 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 trauma or or your pain. It could also be a way to express joy and love. Uh, so that's very important. And I I've been realizing that in a way that could be even more healing and more therapeutic to focus on joy and and love and community rather than. Um, reliving the the darkest moments of, of my life so uh, that's just been a sh recent shift for me um, I will say that the the mainstream art world does love the the idea of the the tortured mad artists um, and since I, I do identify as mad and I've been fighting for mad rights, um, it, it you know it, it's often like I said expected that my art is always going to be about madness or about mental health, um, and that's 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 not the case. But I I do think it might seep through because that's part of my identity, um, and. Also, I'm Lebanese Canadian, and so that might seep through as well. That might seep through into my art. Um, my intersectional identities definitely can show up in my art, but I've just been very aware recently of the difference between um, those identities coming through my art 
um, organically or coming through my art because that's what's expected of me by society or, or funders um, and then realizing the damage that that can cause if I'm not in a headspace where I want to talk about my trauma or my intergenerational trauma or you know racism or Islamophobia or, or ableism or any of that um, just because I am an activist <laughs> I often do want to tackle those topics um, but I think during the pandemic I started to feel a little burnt out and I was just like you know I just want to create art that's beautiful I just want to look at beauty I just want it to to have fun and um, in, enjoy my art. I, I don't always want it to have to have this great big meaning um, or, or goal of activism behind it because I think there's space for both kinds of art um, but you, you need to also take space to celebrate joy and self-love and it, it can't always be, be this. so yeah, so I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I think that um, celebrating yourself can sometimes be more healing than channeling the, the traumas through the art. At least at least for me, that's that's been my experience. Because I feel at the end of the day, if I'm making a painting of flowers, I feel in a better mood than if I'm making a painting, you know, that's about uh panic attacks or something like like about some kind of mental thing that I've gone through but it, it seems at least in my experience that people are more interested in the darker darker images the the art that's full of pain and, and trauma and I don't know necessarily why that that reason is but it, it's been hurting me to always express that when I'm not sometimes when I'm not ready to, to express it so that's just been my own personal journey um, and I, I'm trying to go back to the original reason that I started doing art was just because I loved it like as a child I just made I just wrote stories and I painted and I I would act like do these little performances um, with my friends just because it was fun so I'm trying to go back to that inner child and just make art for the sake of making art and, and not necessarily having those lofty goals of like, I'm going to change the world through my art and I'm going to enact social change <laughs> through my art. Um, I think there's a time and place for that, but I also think it's just so important to just have fun with it and express yourself the way you want. Yeah, thank you. Amazing, Hanan. Thank you so much for expressing your, your opinions and your experience and your insights. And I love how you mentioned that art always comes first and the healing kind of comes organically after. It's not something that you always have to pursue. So thank you so much for bringing that to light. There was a lot of points that we'll get into later that you kind of brought up. So thank you so much for that. And of course... Last but not least, we have Victoria. Please introduce yourself and let us know what you do. Thank you. I'm like in euphoria here listening to the both of you. I'm like, oh, right, I have to speak. Why? I just want to listen to the two of you. <laughs> um, my name is Victoria. I am a dancer and choreographer and an expressive arts therapist. And I work at uh, a woman's shelter. So my my entry point into the arts and uh, the healing component of, of the arts is also first as an artist. And um, in the early 2000s, I was part of a collective called Mata Dance. It's a dance and activist collective in Toronto. And we were a group of women, women identified folks who um, some of us had dance training, some of us didn't have dance training or, or you know, like professional dance training, but we we're all dancers and we all had a passion for movement and sharing stories as well as um, incorporating the stories through activism. So our rallies and streets and demonstrations were our stage. And through that process, 
um, became very apparent to me the relationship between the healing component of art without it being art therapy. Um, and sort of how things roll, one thing leads to the next. I got invited to run a movement workshop at a women's shelter, and then it happened at another shelter. And then before I knew it, I was working at, at, at the shelter that I'm currently working at. And it's been seven years of witnessing lives transform through the process of art making as a tool to dive into the self and self rediscover and self reorient and self redetermine. Um, it's, I often feel extremely privileged of being able to incorporate these two worlds of the therapeutic more clinical world and the artistic. Um, my first art form is movement. That is what I, that is my preferred language. But I'm also a painter and I love doing installations and with expressive arts therapy, which is the particular modality or the type of therapy that I, that I work with. We work with an array of of art modality. So anything from sculpture to installation, to music, to drawing, to writing, to movement and so forth. Um, and I find often a lot of similarities between the, the process of creation, the creative process in performance arts with the, what we call um, an expressive arts therapy or like the harvesting or the diving in for lack of a better word into the therapeutic world. So these explorations were exercises that force us to, um, or invite us to go into a process of, of creativity without really knowing where we're going to end up. And in that process of unfolding or drawing or making art or making music, when themes and stories and patterns and shapes inform us about ourselves, our past, our present and our future, then we begin to shift where we want to shift. And that's what I really love about this mixture of the art and the healing is that it's very person-centered. It's very much about the choices that I want to make, the shifts that I want to make. And it's not because of a, a professional or a doctor or a therapist is telling me to that I need to make sh certain shifts. It's the art that manifests truths about myself that either I want to continue pursuing or that I want to hold or that I want to shift. And if I want to shift them, then I get to be in the room with someone else that can support me in that process of shifting the relationships to trauma, to other individuals. Um, and I think as uh, we live in a world where we're constantly performing, we have all this social media and um, even today we're all I'm performing, right? There's an aspect of myself that I'm bringing forward that is not necessarily the Victoria that I carry that that I carry throughout the day, right? It's still me. It's a part of me. Um, but I find that because we're constantly performing, that this concepts of who we are get a little bit lost and morphed and and confused. And if we don't stop to to listen to ourselves we get lost, we get lost in society and within ourselves. So I find that the arts are such an important anchor and, and we don't need to be, as both of you mentioned, we don't need to have um, professional skills, but the arts will bring us, will bring us to our truth, will guide us, will we'll show us, we'll, there will be our companion. Um, I've just recently gone through a, um, a separation and in that I've been journaling every day words and then responding to the words with art. 
um, particular watercolors. And I chose a, a, a type of watercolor or a, a modality that I wasn't so comfortable with also to challenge myself. And it's just incredible how the subconscious speaks through the arts. And I think um, both listening to both you, Hanan and Tansina, I, I, yeah, I resonate a lot with that um, almost like impulsive sense of healing that just by doing the, the act of the art happens. And, and, and it's fascinating. And every day in being in this field, I am in awe. And I, I every day I'm, I'm learning with every client I'm learning with every therapeutic session that I'm in, I'm learning. And it's just, it's a, it's a vast field and world. I think we're very, very privileged and we should, we are absolutely just, um, yeah, just very privileged and blessed to be in this, in this field. Thank you so, so much, Victoria, again, for all, all three of you have been so open and, and shared so much experience already without even diving into the theme. We're already talking about it. And thank you so much for bringing that up because that's exactly what we're here to do. And it was amazing. You say you're in awe of the arts, but I'm in awe of the three of you just hearing you talk and express yourself. It's a blessing. So thank you so much for doing so and being so open and, and so conversational. Like it's, it's amazing. Um, so of course, I wanna highlight the theme of today's panel, which is collective healing through the arts. I know we kind of already kind of touched on that, but I wanna go back to what does that really mean for you? Um, I know we've talked about kind of personally healing through the arts, but as you've healed through the arts, how do you think that's been reflected on the communities you work with? Um, so I guess we can start kind of switch up the order. We can kind of start with Hanan first. Thanks, Veronica. Uh, so uh, it's collective healing, right? Yeah. So for me, uh, I think when we had the one-on-one -on -one panel, I think I really dove into a lot. So I somehow want to summarize everything I said in that full hour. Uh, so I think collect collective healing, to have collective healing, we need to heal body, mind, and soul. Um, and I think what I started with the body and to say that in order to you know even be able to create art you need to be in a to have the ability to physically feel well enough to even maybe pick up your your paintbrush so we need to cover the basics like shelter and and food um so you you can't like i i think there's a lot often there's this like romanticization of being a poor suffering. um but just from lived experience i know it's very very difficult to create art and to be creative when you're um worrying about being homeless or not being able to pay rent or not having enough food um and thankfully i've never had to get to that point where I've had to um, live on the streets. And I know other folks have gone through that. And so I can't imagine art being a priority if you're on the streets or you're hustling just to, to pay your rent. It's very, very challenging. Um, so I think, first of all, we need to set up the environment um, to, to be uh, a place where you feel safe enough and secure enough to be creative so your very basic needs um that are you know on the bottom of that maslow's hierarchy like shelter and food like those need to be met and if those aren't met it's really really difficult to be creative like creativity is the last thing on your mind you're just trying to survive so we have to get folks out of survival mode we have to help have them feel safe um, so for me, that's, that's body and, you know, I'm not going to get too, too much into it, like politically, but things like, you know, universal basic income, shelters, um, uh, better, you know, higher paid ODSP for folks with disabilities, 
um, just all of these different social pro programs would really help um, with just meeting people's basic needs. So that there is that on one hand, and then with with mind, um, that for me would include things like actual therapy, like clinical therapy. Um, I am a bit anti psychiatry. I'm leaning more towards alternative medicine, but I will acknowledge like people, some people do need to take medications. And if you can't afford your medications, if you don't have health insurance, um, then you can't pay for these really expensive, uh, you know, psychiatric medications or even for physical medications for physical health. So we need things like pharmacare. So you know, you can't really create art if you're, you know, in a state of mania or if if you're you're in deep, deep depression. Um, it's really difficult to be creative. So we, we need to have these very basic needs met because you're you're being told all the time, go get help, go get therapy. But therapy is so unaffordable and the waiting lists are so long. So we need um, ways to access uh, help. We need ways to access therapy and we need ways to also be able to have the freedom to choose to access alternative uh, methods of healing or, or therapy, alternative medicine, which isn't, which isn't covered. Like if I want to go to a naturopath, that's not something that I can really afford right now, but it's something that I, that I want to do because I've just Personally, I feel like I've given up on kind of mainstream, uh, me the mainstream medical world. Um, so it's it's just very, very unaffordable. So I think in order to, n to nourish our mind um, and to ha we need to have access to those therapies and then we're coming into the soul. And I think that's where art can be very healing because I think art, you know, it does tap into bo body, mind, soul, all three, but I think it especially taps into soul um and for soul what i think we need is community we need to be together we need love we need self-love first of all but we also need communal love and we need communal empathy communal compassion um so i think in terms of collective healing th through the arts yeah i you know maybe i'm being a bit radical but i think we we need to first of all have all of that social change um you know advocate for social justice because we can't just be like oh you know we're gonna heal through the arts but if our basic needs aren't being met then the arts aren't gonna be good enough so i think we can use art as the tool to critique um these various issues to bring attention to them um, and in the meantime, while, you know, we still don't have universal basic income or pharma care and, and folks are still unhoused, we can come together as a community, as a collective, um, and help each other and love one another and be kind. Um, and we can, we can try our best to be creative and to express ourselves through the arts. But I just personally, as a person who, who is mad, who has been poor, um, my lived experience is that just creating art it's by itself is, is not enough. And I um, have found that in periods where I've had more stability and more security, I've been a lot more creative. Um, and th throughout my, my journey, like in my darkest times, I wanted to create art. I did. I wanted to create art. But you, you have to think about it, especially for visual arts. How can you create art if you can't afford the materials? Um, how, how can you do that? So I think we just always really have to acknowledge that having access to art as a tool for healing is something... Um, that is a privilege that that is a luxury um and if folks are able to access that then i think they should ex uh extend out and share that access with other folks so if you're lucky enough to be able 
to afford arts materials, to have that stability, you can now go into the community and share that and share at the very least, like just share your knowledge um, with the community. So that's just my kind of opinion on the collective healing. I feel like we need all these various aspects um, in order to heal as a society. Um, and now it, that's not to say that individually we can't pursue our own arts uh, practices in whatever ways that we can. I mean, like, sure, it's nice to get, you know, the, the $50 oil paints from, from the art shop, but if your goal is just to have fun and express yourself, dollar store paints are, are good enough. So I, th there's just a lot there to unpack, and I think sometimes there's a bit of pretentiousness that can come from certain art spaces where you're, um, like in the fine arts world, you know, where you're expected to have uh, gallery uh, level canvases, like student grade is not good enough, it has to be professional grade. And I, like to me, you know, I'm just gonna say, you know, that's just bullshit, like whatever. If all you can afford is Dollarama materials, if all you have is just like a pencil, you know, I saw this really great artist, I forget their name, but they created art just using pen and paper. So anything could be a tool for art. And like Victoria was saying, like your your body, like you could just use your body to, to be a way to create art. Like I I think humans can be very, very resourceful. Um, and I think we, we need to acknowledge that all of that is valid, that it's all art. It doesn't have to be in a fancy gallery or, you know, you don't have to have the most expensive musical instruments or a shiny new laptop where you're writing it could just be um the basics and it's still to me that's still art and it's still valid and it doesn't have to be you know quote unquote professional or or high class or whatever um so that that's just my thought on on that so we need to kind of decolonize the idea of like what art is um and for a long time what it's been portrayed as because when I teach um, my workshops I'll, I'll have a lot of people you know say to me like well you know I, I I'm not an artist I can't create art and and I say well why why don't you just try because I, I think you are an artist you just don't know that yet because in their their idea they're like well I'm not I'm not good at it I'm not good at it and you know and then so, so this idea of to, to be an artist, you have to be like, what and, and it's like, what does good at it mean? Like, what does being good at art mean? And I think often what it means to people is that it's going to be a commodity. It's something you can sell, something you can capitalize off of. So if you create something and it's not sellable, then that means you're not good at it. And there, therefore, there's no value in, in creating. So that's something that I try to get people to change their perspective on, to say that there's still value in the process of creating the art, even if it's not something that you can sell, even if it's not something that, you know, the AGO is gonna wanna hang on their gallery walls, even if it's not something that maybe um, in, in the Western society is gonna accept as art. It's still valid, it's still art. Um, as long as you feel like it's art, then it's art. And as long as you feel like you're an artist, then you're an artist. And you know, who cares what these these professional bodies are defining artists as? Usually it all has to do with money and, and capitalism. And unless you're paid, you're not an artist. And I just completely disagree with that. So those are the kind of the notions that I've been wanting to challenge. So yes, make art accessible and give artists um, basic rights so that they're able to create art. In summary, that's that's what I think we need for collective healing. So accessibility, access to resources. Thank you. Amazing, amazing. Again, in awe with everything you're saying, I'm here nodding and nodding and everything's just resonating in my mind. And I know Tanzina and Victoria can agree fully. Thank you so much for bringing so much to the table. Just, we could stay here hours just talking about one specific topic that you brought out. And it was it was just amazing. Just kind of to, 
to, to recap the holistic uh, side of things. I've known I've had the privilege to talk to each panelist um, about holistic um, well-being. So we we know a lot about that, right? And just just bringing that to the table and the fact that saying that you know I'm an artist or I can heal through the arts. There's a privilege side to that, right? Because not everybody can do that, and it's just it's just bringing that to to the awareness into the table. So thank you so much, and also the fact of you know just because you're not professionally trained doesn't mean you're an artist. I know I've, I've worked with you in, in some of the poetry and personally I can talk. I, I honestly never thought I could write. I'm like, I'm not a writer. That That's just not for me. People would be write this, write that, join the poetry workshop. And I said, but I don't write. What am I going to do there? Right. And then I wrote. And then, then the poetry got published in a, in a new zine that we just created. So it's like, I gave myself that chance and I had the privilege to, to have the opportunity to do so. And I did. And now, and now I love writing. Right. So it's just, and, and, and it was a form of healing for me. So I talk, I talk from experience when I say that, and thank you so much for, for bringing all your ideas and your opinions into, into the space. It's, it's well-deserved. So thank you so much. Tanzina, if we can move on to you. What does collective well-being and, and healing through the arts mean to you and how is this reflected in your work and the communities you work with? Thank you. So a lot of what uh, Hanan said, I just echo that. Um, a couple of things that really stood out was set up the environment and uh, also the communal love and compassion so I want to kind of uh, go with those two points that Hanan brought up and uh, go with my personal experience on those, uh, like setting up the environment. So when I first started uh, to show my art, and that was back in 2015, at that time, there weren't a lot of spaces in Toronto that would accept an artist who's, uh, who doesn't have that professional background in art and doesn't know a lot of people, doesn't have, a, a, like they'll ask, uh, okay, so how many exhibitions have you been in? Um, none. So <laughs> it's like just struggling to find that space. And then I eventually got into a couple of group shows and when I went there, I was just surrounded by people that were just there. They were beside me, but there was this wall and I didn't feel comfortable. I didn't feel part of the community. I didn't feel welcome. And uh, so after uh, two or three experiences like that, uh, my husband and I, we decided that, okay, we're going to do our own we're going to create our own space. So we found this, um, it was called Tantra Lounge. It was like a bar restaurant space in Sinclair. And uh, they had a lot of nice uh, wall space. So we approached them that we want to put art on your wall. Um, they had someone doing that in the past and that person had discontinued. So we said, okay, we can uh, put art on the wall. And they agreed, like uh, we didn't have to pay to be there. It's just, we were gonna decorate their wall, fill their wall and keep changing it every month. So we just went on social media, found artists and uh, we created a space where everyone would be welcome. It had to be an inclusive space. And we were not going to judge by who has professional background and who's doing, like whether they're bringing in art that's just um, sketches, like uh, Hanan was mentioning, like pencil and paper and, uh, and pen and ink or huge canvases, like everyone was welcome. And when we were curating, I would imagine myself with my art in that space and make sure that every single piece was hung with the same compassion and love that like for every piece, like equally. So 
it wasn't like, okay, this is a really nice piece. And it came from an artist that's been painting for like 20, 30 years. And everyone in Toronto knows them because that was an inclusive space where there were professional full-time artists and then there were beginners and then there were students like everyone together and they were put side by side and the like the different pieces had to complement each other it wasn't like okay let's put all the good art on this wall that has better visibility and let's put the not so good art way in the corner that no one can see. No, it was like they needed to, um, like even the art was they, as if they were a community, they were holding each other up. So you would have a, a big painting and then you could have a collection of pen and ink sketches and then something else, but it all had to flow well and they brought out the best in each piece. And when artists would come to the reception, we would have like um, non-visual artists also there, they like performing and with stories and music and poetry. And the vibe had to be warm. Like that was the environment that was more important to us than anything else. And if sometimes artists would come alone, they didn't have anyone else to bring with them. And we made sure because it was a restaurant setting that no one was sitting alone. If we found someone sitting alone, oh, you know who I want you to meet? So just bring them and set them with another table and then bring someone else from another table and kind of kept on bringing people from one place to another and kind of, creating that environment where you're not here to just have your own little tables and your own little space. This is a place where we want you to intermingle because that's exactly what we wanted to come out from, what we were experiencing when I first started showing my art. So, and that really created such a warm vibe that we started with 14 artists within a year we had uh, over 200 artists. And uh, at that point we uh, opened our own gallery and every two weeks we would have exhibitions. And it was always like the comments would always have that common um, tone to it that we just love coming here because of the vibe. Just getting together. So the receptions were more about getting the community together and kind of talking to each other about their art. And a lot of artists that felt shy, that felt like, oh no, I'm not good enough to show my art in a gallery. And uh, we, would, we wouldn't force them. We would just say, why don't you come to one of our receptions? And they would come and they would see that there's so much art that comes from so many variety of different levels and they would fit right in and they saw how people reacted to all that art and uh, started making friends. And uh, then they would say, okay, I'm ready to show here as well. So that was a really beautiful community and um, that we really loved. So unfortunately, due to circumstances, we had to close the gallery. And uh, so another point that I wanted to bring out because I don't want to take up all the time was the communal love and compassion um, as an artist. Uh, so during COVID, I just recently, not really, like it's been a year now that I started uh, joining a weekly art group called Bindas that was started by one of my artist friends that we met through Artusias and uh, Viva. And uh, she created this space at her home. Uh, first she created the space called Artist Hub that was for artists to get together. And then she, uh, I think fall of 2019, early fall of 2019, they started a group of artists just getting together Thursday mornings to create together. Everyone would do their own thing. 
And during COVID, it went online. And that's when I was able to join because I couldn't join when it was in person. It was just, I couldn't make time. And ever since I started, it was like, I'm so appreciative. Even this morning, I, I was uh, running behind on a lot of stuff, but I made time to join them. Even though I didn't create today, I said, I had to come and say hi and spend like 45 minutes with them. So it's not only about making art, but it's about that communal love, that chatting and catching up and telling jokes and getting each other's feedback. Oh, this is what I'm working on. What do you think? And everyone would give their honest feedback and uh, someone would sometimes uh, read a story and we'll be laughing and crying and sharing like all of that while we're creating, doing our own thing. So like that is so important. Like art, it is healing when you're doing it yourself, but also when you're doing it in a community, it's a completely different experience. Like that's also a very powerful healing tool. So, Thank you. No, thank you. Of course, thank you for sharing your whole experience. I wish we could have experienced the gallery. It sounds like a, such an amazing, <laughs> like you said, warm vibe. And, and with artists, mm -hmm. I love surrounding myself with people that inspire me. So definitely that, that, that sounds amazing. Thank you so much for also highlighting the fact that we do build a community through the arts and, and community is a collective, right? So that's, that ties right into our theme and, and that's such an important topic. So thank you so much for that. And Victoria, what are your thoughts? What are your opinions? Yeah, um, I guess something I'd like to add to the conversation is the, the power of the reflection when we're, where we're in collective spaces. So I have found both in my own experience being part of collective or, or um, healing groups, whether it's through arts or other therapeutic practices, as well as what I've witnessed in the room facilitating groups, is that the beauty of, of the collective power is being able to, to see oneself in someone else's art, someone else's experience in the way that they sing a song or the way that they speak a, or read a poem that they wrote or the way that they paint a particular image has a re resonance with the self that is surprising or that can be surprising. And therefore in that cross-contamination, there is a, there is, there's a healing component because someone else expresses an aspect of oneself that we didn't know how to express it. And so I find that with collective, collective healing is it's so unexpected and it, it opens up for such powerful opportunities because of how we relate to one another. Also, there's been um, in, instances, for example, where um, there is, um, I'm facilitating a, a, a group of, that we're, we're looking at connecting to the voice and movement, for example. And the way that someone might sing really resonates with someone else and it just brings out tears in someone else. And so the, the, there's at, at a chemical level, there's a, a a connection that is beyond us. And I think that that's where um, this collective, um, the collective has a lot of potential for healing um, because of these surprises and where we end up working at levels that, that are subconsciously so deep that we don't even know are happening. That shift, that chemistry is shifting even by being in a room with somebody else. I think also in terms of thinking more globally, right now, the arts are supporting big, big campaigns internationally. So whether it's the banners or the images or the 
the poetry that's written or the speeches. So at a, at a global level, the arts are connecting us continuously and they have been for a really long time. And it's through the colors and the images and the words that get shared through the, yeah, again, the campaigns or the Facebook or the images that, that, that different movements end up surfacing. And subconsciously that stays with us. Those, those images, those fists, the rising, raising fists or the colors stays with us. And therefore we're all being informed in the same way that marketing and capitalism informs us constantly. Art has that, it's, it's all done through art also in a way, whether it's a, an ad for Adidas or an ad for Gap, it's still, there's an art artistic element in those, in, in, in the visual campaigns that subconsciously are informing us. And so if that is true and, and effective, then so can art with alternate messages. And, and so thinking globally, we have a great power at our hands that, um, that for a long time, it's been with us and, it's, and we've seen it throughout history of how powerful art has been a, a, a companion for mobilizing lots of communities. Amazing, thank you so much. I love how each panelist kind of brought a, a little different perspective into the question and highlighted a new a new topic that again, we can talk about for ages, right? But thank you so much for, for bringing up the fact that art is everywhere. Literally anywhere you see art is there, even if you don't want to acknowledge it, it is there. And there's kind of a little artist inside of us and each person, and, you know, some people are like, oh, no, I can't do that. No, I, 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 God, no, I can't. But if we do try a little bit, if we are surrounded by a community that pushes forward that, that kind of artistic fire in you, I think it's definitely something that's, that's worth challenging in and, and, and creating, right? So thank you so much for bringing all those insights in. And now that we've kind of talked about what we thought, you know, collective healing is and, and art, I want to kind of move forward into what can we do now? Now that we know that art is a way of healing and, and art can, can, can be transformative, really, what is the next step in your practices or as a collective, what can we do as a next step to really implement art into our lives and, and just heal as a collective? Um, I think we can start with Tanzina. Well, uh, I would say like, stay connected, stay connected with your communities and uh, keep practicing art. Um, like uh, try to find groups that you can, uh, that you can join that, uh, so I'm just talking about artists or people that want to pursue arts or want to find a way to show their creativity or just kind of practice. So um, like I said, when I joined that group, it really made a big difference because that kind of forces you to make time for art instead of just being by yourself and then life gets in the way. So stay connected. I would say that would be my biggest advice. Perfect. And, and something so valuable, of course, staying connected with your community and just communities in general, just like Muse or any other arts organization out there. There's always programs. There's always something to do, especially during these times. It is so, so crucial to, to get out there and join anything. Let's say you don't sing, do, do a singing, you know, workshop. Maybe you'll like it. You never know, right? It's just putting yourself out there. So yeah, thank you. absolutely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hanan, what are your thoughts? Um, honestly, I just want to echo what Tanzina said. I think staying connected to our communities is the most important thing. It's kind of difficult to just be an island and create art alone. Like you can't create art in a vacuum. So I think definitely there are so many free uh, art classes, um, even ones where you get the materials delivered to your to your home. You'll get them in the mail. So 
you know, even if it's unaffordable for you to take a uh, expensive, you know, art, art class at a formal institution, there's all these community arts organizations that um, are facilitating various workshops, various classes, there's um, grants, there's funding that you can pursue. There are so many ways to, to access the, the arts. Um, so I'd encourage people to actually um, take advantage of those those opportunities. Um, I know like now we're, we're in COVID, but I had learned that even like the public library has a uh, instrument lending program where you can go and rent out instrument, musical instruments. Um, yeah, and there's uh, different arts organizations where you can uh, use different like digital art equipment or um, just you know, visual arts materials and for writing I always say all you really need is like a pen and a piece of paper to, to write so that's that's always great um, and I know it's it's difficult right now for certain disciplines like theater and, and performance art um, but you know the world's a stage so you can maybe take advantage of the outdoors like I did a performance art on zoom it was it was strange but we could just make use of different spaces that we have so yeah i'd say to to stay connected and just try to use whatever um resources are available to you um and you'll be surprised at how creative we can all be even in the limitations of of the pandemic very very true I, I think we've all been a witness of of how limiting, of course, the pandemic can be. But the art that has been produced in the pandemic has been insane. So nothing really can stop us at this point, right? Not even a pandemic. So thank you for bringing that to light. Victoria, how about you? Yeah, um, connection. Connection in your communities. I think the libraries are a really great, uh, really useful tool as well as, I mean, use art, art starts. We, uh, we fortunately, even with, through all the limitations, we have a beautiful city that we live in that has a lot of programs and, and, and a submergence of, of programs, an emergence of programs for connectivity through community that we've seen now through the pandemic. Um, and if folks need more information or want support in finding ways to connect, feel free to reach out to me, um, whether through Muse Arts or through uh, my website. Um, but there, there are, and it's, it's um, and it doesn't take too much to connect. As, as, as frightening as sometimes it can be. Um, I think once the connection is made, it's easier to stay connected. Um, sometimes just making that first step is, is quite frightening to join a group, um, to call up a friend, to, um, that can be frightening. But once, once, that, once that step is crossed, the connectivity and the art kind of take over. I have found in my experience. And I think that we, yeah, take advantage of, of the, well, at least we have some funding. We do have structures, we do have organizations, we have collectives that are constantly trying new things and trying to, to build and, and, and roll out art that is for community. And that's really fantastic about our city. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I know Toronto is, is, is a city full of art and artists, you know, either waiting to emerge or, or really into the arts. And, and that's something we have to take advantage of, of course, we are so fortunate to live here. So that is definitely um, a point bringing, uh, uh, bringing awareness to that point is very important. I kind of want to end the session. I know we're, we're at three and, and this panel goes up to 3.30. So I guess we can spend a little bit of time talking about what would be some some tips or advice that you have for people that that are kind of skeptical of the arts and, and healing through that, right? Some people might be like, 
what is a journal and a pen going to do for me? You know, I rather go to therapy, you know, the traditional therapy. So any tips or advice you have for people that are kind of skeptical or community artists that don't really know how to start a community or how to heal through the arts? Is there any advice or tips? I guess we can start with Victoria. Sure. Um, follow Muse Arts. It's a great way. <laughs> And not just because we're here on this panel, but because Muse Arts, um, it, it, it's a bit of a magnet in the city and, and, and it's collected to, connected to so many satellite projects and in individuals in the city. Um, so that is one recommendation. Also just to try it. Uh, I still remember so clearly the first time that I did a, a painting, a, a three-day therapeutic painting uh, session in silence and the challenges that I experienced with myself in this painting in a room full of other individuals where we couldn't speak, um, we couldn't listen to music and we had to just paint and let our subconscious kind of take over and there was a starting Point and there was an ending point and at the ending point whatever we had we had to share with the group and we had to talk about our art and that experience I will never forget because I was so surprised I was skeptical at the beginning um, I wanted to have my music and it's not to say the music is, is, is there's anything wrong with that but this experience is very much about taking away as many distractions as possible and just being with oneself and what I learned about myself and what I learned about my process, my creative process and what I learned about other individuals was quite transformative um, and really carried me emotionally, psychologically, spiritually for until now, it continues to carry me through. So it's just, giving it a try, experiencing it. I think with art and art therapy, expressive arts therapy, holistic therapies, that it's not necessarily about being the artist. It's not about the quality of the product, but more about the process and just getting your hands dirty with the paint and the clay and the music and the movement and seeing what happens. And so I think that that's fantastic because there's not a prescribed equation. And so there's, it's an abundance of opportunities for transformation and it's an opportunity. There's very little to lose and there's way more to gain. And so just try it, try, try different modalities, try different groups, try, um, there's also some great videos on YouTube for, to self-direct processes. So now, um, yeah, I'd say just be curious. I think curiosity is a really important and vital um, companion for our life journey. Yes. Thank you so much for, for those amazing tips and advice. And I like what you said about the end about curiosity. A lot of people are like, curiosity kills the cat. Honestly, I think curiosity kept the cat living. Um, <laughs> I think I think we kind of have to switch those those old traditional sayings, right? So thank you so much for bringing that to, to light. Um, I think we can go ahead with Hanan. What are some tips on people that are skeptical about collective healing through the arts? Um, I feel like Victoria really covered it all, but um, yeah, I think you can't knock something till you try it. Um, and I would say even like give it more than one chance because depending on the circumstances that you try it in or your mood, um, you might not like it the first time. It might not resonate with you. Um, you, you know, you shouldn't just uh, scratch it all off based on one experience. Um, and I'll say, yeah, like try different art forms. Not all of it might work for you. And also don't like expect some kind of like miraculous um, recovery. Like oh, I'm gonna start journaling and that's just gonna um, fix 
everything. Like that's that's not realistic. And I think maybe if people go go into it with that mindset, they might give up. Um, so if you're going into it with just an open mind and just feeling like I'm just gonna try this out and see what happens, um, you're it's not you're not gonna yeah miraculously heal overnight or anything. I think it's just like another tool. Um, and I will say it's not to say like. Uh, using art as a therapeutic tool is a replacement for actual therapy. Um, so it's, it's, it's not, it's just an additional tool that you can use. I think that's good to note that as well. It's just the, the idea of the holistic healing, right? So it's just part, one part of that. Um, yeah, so just say I try out different art forms and give it a chance and just be open-minded about it um and yeah don't have expectations of of perfection so I think that could really hinder you when you're you're trying to experience new new art forms um yeah that's why like in in my experience I um the first time I encountered sound poetry I absolutely hated it um because the the person teaching it was you know they they didn't have the right uh soul like they didn't just connect with them and then i was taught how to do it from like an indigenous person who really brought the soul into it and so now i really love sound poetry as a therapeutic tool like i love just going into the forest and making sounds and sounding and it's because um the I had the right teacher for that. So sometimes different factors can play into your, your experience of, of, an, of an art form. So I, yeah, I would say like, it's important to have, again, the right environment to, to foster that. So yeah, just try it out and be open-minded and try it out again a second time if the first time doesn't go well, because I, was so glad that I, I was open-minded to trying that out again because my initial experience was just like no I hate this <laughs> I hate this so much but it's one of my favorite things now so yeah thank you yes of course thank you everything that you said was so true you know it's just having that right community it's it's having that sense of 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 being genuine and open like you said you had a new teacher and then you found a love for it right but you would have never found that if you never tried in the first place so so thank you so much for that advice Tanzina what are your opinions your thoughts yeah I definitely echo both of them <laughs> Victoria and Hanan like uh, what Victoria was saying that it's about the process not the product when you're using art for healing just Forget about the, what you're creating and just enjoy the whole process, enjoy the experience of it and um, just express whatever you're feeling through your art. So start that way and uh, don't even um, like, don't even think about the product. So if you don't want to show it to anyone, you don't have to, but whatever you create, it's just for you. When you have that in mind, you kind of let go of any fear, any doubt, and just go with whatever you feel like, because um, you know that you don't have to show it to anyone. And uh, something that Hanan was mentioning earlier, that uh, sometimes you don't want to create art that shows like the negative side of your experiences. Maybe you only want to show the positive and what you want to feel and what you do feel right now. So only the happiness and joy. So it's all up to you. What do you feel like expressing through your art? Don't do what others expect you to do. So just be true to yourself and, um, and go for it create and uh and again it is a holistic healing practice so 
you take care of your body, mind, and soul when you're using art for healing. So make sure you like take care of um, your eating habits, your activities, and uh, try to meditate or do whatever. You don't have to meditate in like closed eyes and sitting or lying down in one place. If walking is your meditation, dancing is your meditation, singing is your meditation, then do that. So, and uh, art as well. It's not only visual arts, like whatever creative uh, way you can express yourself, just use art as a tool to express yourself. And that's how you heal. And try to stay in touch with others that also kind of share the same same mindset and uh, maybe you can create together and uh, make it a collective healing practice so yeah <laughs> amazing amazing again in awe and just so inspired by hearing these three amazing panelists talk it has been a privilege and an honor to be here today and thank you so much for all the insights and and the incredible session that we've had today thank you so much for taking the time to be here and of course thank you to everybody who has connected who has showed their love in the comment section um if you go back to this recording you'll see all the love and all the feedback that we've been getting so it's been amazing amazing thank you so much again to each one of you for being here and being so open with your experiences and your advice and 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 talking about so so things so much deeper than just healing through art right we've touched on so many topics that's why i think it was it's been such a rich um session so thank you so much and of course thank you to muse arts for presenting these spaces for creating this community because we are a community right here right now and and it's been such an amazing amazing experience so thank you so much and What's even better is that we have more in store. This is just the beginning of Happening Multicultural Festival. We have another panel happening at 4 p.m. And then we have Poetry Night, which is going to be so exciting today at 7. So stay tuned for so many other things. And we'll, we'll see you guys later. Thank you so much.